All right, I get to talk about the Information and Communications Technology, or ICT, research in EPP. Uh, even the name is a little strange. When I got here, we called this telecom policy. So this is a reflection of the fact that an awful lot of new things are happening, including security and privacy and other things you're going to hear about in a minute. Um, so what is telecom and ICT policy? If I, if I think in 2017 as a telecom person, well, clearly we're, we're worried about, you know, can we, can we get fiber into the big cities? Verizon and Google have done some of it, but they've stopped, and there's a lot of people wondering how we're going to get it further. Beyond the big cities, how are we going to get tele, telecom to rural areas in the U.S. and around the world? Big telecom issue in 2017. Mobile satellites on the telecom issue, on the telecom side, are really interesting. If you followed Elon Musk, for example, really exciting things using satellite for mobile instead of stationary in new ways. Um, if I go up the stack a little, encryption technology and policy is really hot. Look at what our attorney general has said recently, lots of controversy around encryption. Um, on continue up the stack, uh, I mean, the content issues are huge, right? The internet is a tidal wave. It hit everybody who did copyrighted material. It hit music. It hit movies. It hit newspapers. It, it, it has revolutionized all sorts of content. Well, EPP did that. Right? In 1991, David Reed's dissertation, uh, working with Marvin, uh, did a superb job of looking at the engineering economics of bringing fiber to the home. Uh, way back in 1979, Alex Hill's dissertation uh, on bringing telecom to Alaska and to looking at rural areas. Um, mobile satellites, 1989, Sam Anderson had a dissertation on that. Encryption, Grace Hammond's in 1988. And Paul Zare, the uh, electronic de de dissemination of scholarly journals, which got hit by that internet tidal wave, 1990. So all, all of these are more than a quarter of a century old, uh, which means they were completed. The dissertations were done over a quarter of a century old. That is, that is before most of our current students were born. Um, I learned a couple of things from this. One, I learned that if you want to see the future of technology and policy, EPP is and always has been an amazing place to be. I also learned that we apparently never solve anything. I mean, <laughs> Alex was, was working 40 years ago on telecom in rural areas. It should be done by now. Um, so I went through an interesting journey. I had no idea actually how much work there was. Uh, at first scan, and I know I missed a few, uh, I saw 53 PhD dissertations in chronological order here uh, on ICT over the years. And like I said, I apologize if your name is missing and you should be here. There are a few. And that does not include the master's work. And that, more importantly, because this is a probably a large number, does not include the, the students advised by EPP faculty who got their degree in other departments. I know I have infected the work of many electrical and computer engineering students, and, uh, and so they don't show up on this list. So this is a large body, of, it's literally a large body of work. I've been reading the dissertations. They're bigger than I am. Um, so we can't talk about all of it. We're going to talk about some pieces. Uh, I guess, uh, well, I'm going to talk in a minute about wireless. Uh, Marvin is going to come up after that and talk about broadband systems. We have Lori Craner is going to talk a little about privacy and security. And then our, one of our survivors, uh, alum Martin Weiss, now professor at University of Pittsburgh, will, will, will be our, uh, our keynote or rebuttal, as, as you prefer. Um, <laughs> I know this, is, this still just scratches the surface. There's so many other topics. I actually, I had a longer list of, of topics we're not going to get to, but then Marvin has like 100 slides, so I had to remove a lot of those. Um, but for example, we're not going to talk about the creation of ICT today, but there's some really interesting work on whether it's the standards processes or open source software or outsourcing. Um, there's lots of going on at the application layer, lots of work on internet payment systems, on ICT and education. 
peer-to-peer -peer file sharing and, and copyright issues and electronic publishing and CDNs. We don't have time. Um, trust us, it's great. We're going to talk about, so I'm going to talk about wireless. That's, that's my piece. And even there, I'm not going to talk about everything. I'm going to talk about three interesting pieces of wireless, all of which, I th all where I think EPP has made a real difference. And the first, um, and it's something I didn't see these themes until I went back and I like, looked at 40 years of dissertations. Uh, the first is the idea that you can actually use wireless to do what had been done in wires, uh, in particular in less developed areas. Um, in 2017, people think this is the natural order of things. Not all that long ago, we talked about leapfrogging that wireless was this wild idea that you'd skip the wired stage and it was at one time a, a, a strange idea. And before that, it had no name, but it was being worked on in EPP. Um, and I'll go back to 1979, uh, with this is actually the first dissertation in ICT and EPP. This is Alex Hill's work, who looked at satellite-based telephone and also television in uh, rural parts of Alaska and found out that satellite could be a sustainable approach in rural Alaska if you did a few things. If there were low, low, low interest financing for capital expenditures, or maybe if you change the settlements, that is what net one network pays another network when calls pass through multiple networks. If you change that a little bit, um, you could turn this into something that would be financially sustainable. And not only is that an interesting piece of reading now, because I just looked at it, um, but it also became the basis of the state of Alaska policy regarding both telephone and television. Um, not coincidentally, because Alex ended up working for the state of Alaska after he graduated. Um, I guess his unofficial title he told me was Telecom Czar. I love that title. Um, I think this is actually continuing a theme we heard in the last title, the uh, last talk, that not only are ideas coming out of this place, but the people who walk out of here with those ideas and then go do amazing things at FDA or the state of Alaska is, is, is part of our impact. Um, there have been a lot more since then. Uh, 1998, uh, yay found that PCS technology, wireless technology, can, can provide phones in developing countries, but you need to make a few modifications to make that work. And there's more in the broadband area, but I'm, I'm deferring that to, to, to Marvin. It will be coming. Um, but in, in a number of ways, EPP uh, research has made a difference in this area and still is. I don't know, there's a resi in the room. Uh, there is this, this work continues. Uh, this was a qualifier paper from last year. So hopefully 10 years from now, we'll be talking about her impact. Um, a second area where I think EPP has had a real impact over the years is in the idea of spectrum sharing. The traditional way of managing spectrum in this country and around the world back to the 1920s is to say, I get my spectrum, you get your spectrum, that way we can never interfere with each other. And as of 2017, it has become pretty obvious around the world that that doesn't work anymore, and we are looking for ways to share spectrum. But that work has been going on in EPP since the 1990s when it was blasphemy. Um, and to talk about that, actually, before I talk about the research, um, and one an early project called Wireless Andrews actually comes from, there's an educational contribution, which is a, a, a spin-off, if you like, of EPP, is something called the Information Networking Institute, which is really important in its own right. Uh, this was the, an idea that you have an interdisciplinary master's program, uh, the result of a proposal written by Marvin Serbiu uh, back in 1989, and uh, I guess he and Granger had some kind of blackmail material against our first ICT PhD and managed to drag Alex back to be the first director. Um, that program now graduates 140 students every year. So on an educational perspective, that's, a, that's an important contribution. But I look at the research side, something that came out of INI is something called Wireless Andrew. The idea that you could cover a part of campus and eventually all of campus with wireless broadband. Um, that was, was a technical term, that was the first, world's first microcellular network. It would later get a standard, become a standard from IEEE called 802.11, and it would later have the marketing term Wi-Fi, which probably some of you have heard of. 
um, that a lot of its origins are here. Um, that also, I was, I, was, I was part of that a million years ago and got me very interested in the idea that th these Wi-Fi hotspots, as we would now call them, we didn't then, uh, exist in shared spectrum. And at the time, those were known as junk bands because no one would want to run a wireless system in them. And that led to some research. Uh, the first research, first thesis in spectrum sharing is Hector Salgado, uh, working with Marvin and me, which looked at some of the benefits and problems of sharing bands among cellular carriers, something that no one would think you would do in, in 1995 when, when people read that paper, but in 2017 is actually something that is a very hot topic. Uh, soon after, one of my students, D.P. Satipathy, started publishing on unlicensed spectrum and the benefits and the tragedy of the commons that was going to make this a terrible idea and how you could maybe prevent that tragedy of the commons or at least alleviate it a bit through policy and through standards. Some of the other work, uh, Bill Strauss uh, looked at the spectrum sharing issues of portable devices on airplanes working with Granger. Uh, something I guess we, we now know since that now that now that airlines can charge me thirty dollars for Wi-Fi, those problems seems to have gotten a lot better. But before, <laughs> very controversial. Um, Hiro Igarashi working with me. We was we, it was a lot of talk. With maybe someday you could take TV spectrum and share that spectrum. It was a wild idea. Uh, people have been talking about it for a bit, but Hiro was one of the first to ever quantify whether there's actually any benefits to this, which a couple of years later would become, would be allowed for the first time in the US and now spreading around the world. Um, uh, Ram worked on the idea that you might share raid with radar as well, who looked at the idea that you could have spectrum that is 100% utilized by radar and do more with it anyway. And he quantified, other people had talked about it, again, first person ever to quantify that there are real benefits here and lots of people have followed and now the world seems to be doing this. I guess I'm buying you a drink tomorrow night. I, I spent six years trying to say, say this is <laughs> um, And as in before, the, the, the spectrum work continues. Uh, I'm not sure who's in the room, but spectrum sharing with vehicular networks, Alexander Ligo and, and Sanika uh, Kaplev, who might both be here working on that. Uh, Nirajan Rajkarnakar just published a paper last month on location privacy and spectrum sharing. Uh, Mohammed can't be here. He graduated, but he, he's, he's in Saudi Arabia as a regulator, but a year ago on spectrum aggregation. Two students next, on, well, thinking about next generation television right now, Rolando Betancourt and Aman Tiagi. So hopefully, again, lots more we'll have to say in a few more years. And the last topic of the three I'll talk about in wireless is where I think EPP has made an impact. Actually, it's not the, there are more than three where we've made an impact. The three I chose to talk about uh, is public safety communications. Um, this is research that began after and is a direct response to 9-11 when uh, quite a few people lost their lives because the communication systems used for emergency and disaster response did not work well, including those systems used by firefighters and police and emergency medical services. Um, and then that began a research program. And among the things we discovered is that the systems used then and sadly still primarily used in the US have very limited functionality. They fail often, especially when they are most needed. They are incredibly inefficient in terms of, in terms of spectrum and they cost a lot of money. Um, and after beating them up for a while, we began a program that looked at what you could do instead. And said, instead of doing these on a local level, if you had something common that was at the national level instead of thousands of local systems, and if you adopted the technology, uh, new, different technologies like IP and cellular, and, uh, and if you built infrastructure that was dual use, that supported commercial and a mix of commercial and government in new kinds of ways, you could be much more cost effective. Uh, that was, and that was work by Ryan Hallahan, uh, who published a dissertation in there. He's actually gone off to AT&T. Uh, this work was EPP work, and then in 2009, it became part of the national broadband plan of the United States. It didn't hurt that I had 
gone to the FCC for a little bit and was leading the engineering analysis of parts of the National Broadband Plan, including this one. And I was wholesale adopting work that was done on APP and, and using that in the National Broadband Plan. Uh, in 2010, Congress put $7 billion towards the idea, and like 10 days ago, uh, AT&T got a contract to actually build this system. So it took more than a dozen years from the beginning in EPP, but there is, there, there are, there, there is a huge impact. It may just be huge impact of billions of dollars of wasted money, but it is huge impact. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Marvin to switch to broadband. Okay, so uh, I'm Marvin Serbiu, and I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about research in ICT and EPP that deals with uh, both broadband technology and the economics of networks. Uh, so my, uh, I'll, I'll try and group the research that happens in the 32 years that I've been here in the department and, and beyond uh, into these uh, three uh, categories. One is that a, a huge uh, amount of work has involved building engineering economic models of what it costs to build a multi-service network, one that can provide internet, video, voice, uh, other services. And from these models, learn what's feasible, what's not feasible, what has monopoly characteristics, what's competitive, uh, all with uh, important implications for uh, policy debate. Uh, a second stream of work uh, has dealt with the economics of networks and digital goods, particularly pricing issues. And third, I want to talk about network neutrality and CMU's impact on the, on the policy process. So there are a whole slew of studies that have been done uh, since I arrived here and even before, uh, which essentially looked at how much does it cost to build a network that provides services to everybody. Uh, whether it's to Alaskan villages, as we all already heard about in Alex Hill's uh, uh, thesis, uh, to fiber to the home, DSL, cable, fixed wireless, and so forth. Uh, Alex claims to be the first um, uh, PhD in the actual engineering and public policy department, since before then it was EPA, uh, back in 1979. Uh, one of my first students was David Reed, uh, who went on to a career at the FCC and cable laboratories and now runs a telecom program at the University of Colorado, uh, where uh, in the mid-1980s, the executive vice president of Bell South was uh, claiming that uh, by 1995, uh, we would be uh, deploying widely fiber to the home all across the country. Uh, David Reed did an extensive analysis and concluded it wasn't going to happen uh, and that it was going to be at least a decade later than that. And sure enough, it wasn't until 2004 that uh, Verizon began deploying fiber to the home. Uh, so this was very useful to uh, uh, calibrate uh, what was puff and what was uh, reality in this space. Uh, he also uh, looked at uh, what's the right order in which to make investments, uh, one which led to uh, uh, AT&T choosing to build out DSL first and then uh, fiber to the home only in the last five years, uh, uh, something that was uh, verified by his analysis, uh, which was his uh, qualifier work. Uh, Nosaker Omoigui, who did not complete a dissertation but was a Tour Award winner for his qualifier paper, developed a very uh, useful tool for how to lay out a cable uh, modem network uh, in the optimal way in order, and as part of a uh, paper analyzing the costs of uh, providing internet over cable. And the tool was so useful it was eventually adopted by General Instruments for designing their uh, cable plants for their customers. Uh, after the uh, few years hiatus, we began looking at uh, the economics of uh, digital subscriber line networks as opposed to fiber to the home. Uh, Daniel Frixell and Kanchana Wanichkorn, PhD students uh, published in this space. Actually, the very first papers on DSL uh, were done by um, uh, Scott um, uh, Matthews uh, when he was an undergraduate in the department as a undergraduate research project working with me. This later uh, became uh, the subject of Danielle uh, Frixell's dissertation. Uh, Kanchana uh, took it farther uh, by comparing the economics of cable modems with DSL and with uh, uh, fixed wireless, uh, concluding that as a function of density, 
Uh, if it's really a low density area, fixed wireless is by far the cheapest way uh, to provide uh, broadband and internet services. Uh, but for anything uh, other than the most uh, rural areas, uh, cable uh, was going to be the lowest cost uh, provider. And sure enough, we now see that in the fixed uh, internet market, uh, the cable industry is projected to hold 73% of that market by 2020, uh, an economic result that we were forecasting uh, back in 2002. Um, Rahul Tongia wrote a paper uh, uh, on uh, broadband over power line. Can it compete? The answer turns out to be no. Uh, and, <laughs> yeah, there are people still trying figuring out ways to, to make it work, but uh, so far it hasn't worked, which was important because uh, the FCC at the time was talking that broadband over power line would provide a competitive alternative third to, 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 right, third wire to cable and tel uh, telephone provided broadband, and uh, this was not to be the case. Um, and we've also heard already about uh, studies done on network, uh, the economics of networks in emerging regions, uh, such as the work by uh, Alex Hills and Hung Yo Ye on uh, well, wireless and uh, uh, later by one of John's students, uh, Pritikorn uh, Tentragul, Ten I can pronounce it correctly, uh, on uh, impacts of ICT in, in rural Thailand. Uh, we took another cut at fiber to the home networks uh, in the uh, mid uh, 2000s uh, in work with, uh, by Anupam Banerjee, uh, who uh, observed that one of the technologies for providing fiber to the home was so-called passive optical networks, where you'd run a fiber feeder from the central office out to the neighborhood, and then be a splitter, and you'd deliver the same optical signal to various houses, but you could time multiplex uh, a service to, to those multiple houses. In an era when we were interested in competition and the idea that you might use the fiber, uh, the fiber might be um, uh, sold uh, as an uh, basic network element to multiple competing service providers, this architecture poses a problem because everybody in the same neighborhood has to get service from the same electronic equipment in the central office. Uh, Anupam analyzed an alternative design in which if you laid out the fiber uh, with spending somewhat more money on the distribution portion in order to group splitters together in a cabinet uh, in the neighborhood, you could have uh, different vendors uh, connected to uh, different houses in, uh, in uh, non-adjacent neighborhoods and thereby allow the same fiber to be leased out to different providers uh, for competitive service. Uh, this notion that an underlying fiber plant might be provided on a wholesale basis to competing providers uh, was analyzed economically in his dissertation and is the basis for what Australia is doing in the National Broadband Network, what Singapore and Amsterdam and a number of other countries have decided to do in order to get to recognize that fiber distribution is in some ways a natural monopoly, but we still want competition in services by allowing the fiber to be uh, leased by multiple service providers. Uh, so the second uh, stream of work in, in the department uh, involves economics of networks and of digital goods. Uh, we already heard about the paper by uh, Paul Zare on the uh, provision of scholarly journals and uh, uh, electronic libraries. This when uh, uh, we were just beginning to uh, uh, see the proliferation of the Andrew system on campus and the notion that we would see, read all our journal articles online instead of by going to the library was uh, uh, still uh, very future oriented. This is uh, one development that has happened much faster, I think, than, than we uh, predicted even at the time. Uh, building on that work, uh, John Chong uh, looked at the economics of digital information goods. Could you afford to sell things one at a time, uh, pay 50 cents for a journal article, or did it, was it too expensive to do it that way, and the only way that made sense was to sell subscriptions or even site licenses. Uh, this was important because in a stream of work, which I'm not talking about today, I uh, was involved in uh, developing payment systems that would work with something that only cost 50 cents, so the payment transaction charge had to be on the order of a penny or less. Uh, those systems have never panned out, and it's partly because of 
what John Chong showed in his research, which is the publishers can get all of their profit by s selling subscriptions to the heavy users, and the additional revenue they get by selling one-offs to occasional users isn't worth the effort of implementing the payment system. Uh, okay. Uh, I did a sabbatical uh, a decade ago in France, and uh, out of that came some work on uh, pricing of uh, digital goods in online marketplaces, and uh, why is it that the law of one price for, uh, doesn't apply in the, in, in the internet where Amazon and uh, marketplace will have the same book available at, at thir uh, prices that might differ by three or four hundred percent. One of the uh, other early studies uh, done was how do you price uh, in the presence of network externalities? Um, uh, communications markets uh, are unique uh, in that uh, the more people uh, who use a network, the more valuable it is to potential subscribers. And uh, that's different from uh, most products, and it creates uh, challenges for how you should price it and how, uh, in particular, you should price a, a new network as it diffuses, because it's not worth much when not many people are signed on to it. Uh, and, and Jin Hong's thesis looked at uh, price competition and compatibility in the presence of demand externalities uh, and, and product diffusion. Uh, so, so it's a big addition to the literature on, on the economics of, of networks. Uh, John Chong, in his, in his dissertation, uh, also looked at uh, pricing of multicast communications. Uh, and he considered the case that uh, with multicast, you, you have fewer bit miles of, of traffic that has to be carried than if you unicast to individual uh, endpoints. And he discovered that there was a, a logarithmic relationship in which the relative price of multicast communication to unicast uh, was uh, on the order of n to the 0.8, where n was the size of the group. Uh, this uh, uh, result, which we demonstrated empirically through analyzing a, a wide num range of uh, synthetic networks as well as the ARPANET, uh, then became uh, the subject of numerous follow-on papers by other authors uh, who even uh, generously referred to this as the Chong serbu scaling law. Uh, and it's probably the most cited paper that I've certainly been associated with uh, in my career. Um, other works in pricing involved uh, John Chong, who now teaches at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, uh, on uh, the economics of uh, resale uh, telecommunication service, uh, how you should price uh, sonnet rings, which improve reliability when not all customers value reliability. Uh, and how to price for quality of service, something that has been uh, in the news in the sense of uh, should we uh, have paid uh, prioritization in the context of network neutrality. Uh, Joshua Mindell worked on bandwidth trading and the notion that uh, why can't we trade bandwidth the way we trade uh, uh, pork belly futures and what's unique about uh, uh, bandwidth that's different from energy trading, electricity trading, uh, or other uh, similar uh, markets. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> Pedro Ferreira, who's now a faculty member in EPP and Heinz, uh, looked at the uh, pricing of interconnection between networks, um, uh, peering and transit, and uh, the fact that if you optimally designed all the interconnections between networks, you could do it much more efficiently than what arises from a competitive situation in which each operator uh, finds uh, the Nash equilibrium of where uh, he doesn't want to make a change because he can't make himself better off, and that equilibrium is not as efficient as, as the global. Um, one of the other uh, works that, uh, in, from the department that I think has had a certain amount of uh, policy impact was a study that I did with people uh, at MIT on uh, how does broadband uh, availability affect the local economy. We combined data on broadband deployment from the FCC with economic data from the census and did the first large-scale empirical study of what was the effect of broadband on jobs, on wages, on the creation of new firms, even on house prices. Um, and uh, that uh, work has been widely cited uh, internationally on, on studies of how to close the digital divide. The other area where I think CMU has had a big impact on policy has been the, the network neutrality debate. The network neutrality debate is really when you have competing network providers, say cable and, and, and uh, telco companies providing broadband networks, uh, 
and they have their own applications and content services, uh, will they foreclose independent application and content service providers from running over their networks? That is, will Comcast favor a video from its own uh, company uh, a, a subsidiary, uh, NBC, uh, relative to video from Disney, uh, let's say? Um, and this is at the, at the heart of the network neutrality debate. Um, the very first uh, uh, paper addressing this in the department was work by Joshua Mendel, uh, in which he observed that the current policy uh, classifies as unregulated uh, email and website hosting and instant messaging and IP transport. But that, and while treating as regulated telecommunications, things like plain old telephone service and data services like X25, ATM, and frame relay. And he argued that it made no sense to treat IP transport differently from these other data services, that the line between what was regulated communications and what was unregulated should be moved over slightly so that IP transport would be classified as a basic telecommunications service. And he made that argument in, 2000, in t a TPRC paper in 2000, uh, nearly uh, uh, five years before the term network neutrality was even invented. Uh, later, uh, both uh, John Peha and I uh, published papers on uh, the nature of the uh, network neutrality debate. Uh, and uh, the, the challenges of trying to find a, a policy that would restrain the network providers from, from foreclosing other content and, and application services. Uh, while he was at the FCC and before he came to uh, uh, CMU, Doug Sicker was heavily involved in the FCC's first uh, report on order on this subject in 2010. And finally, in 2015, there was a, a second uh, report uh, notice of proposed rulemaking, which for the first time contemplated the idea of reclassifying the internet as a telecom service. And John Peha, in a series of, of uh, filings at the FCC, uh, uh, the last one arguing that the, if you looked at the strict language of the law, you, you had to classify IP transport as a telecom service. Uh, that was, in fact, what the FCC decided to do. Uh, though that decision is subject to being rolled back in the, in the new administration. Uh, one of the, the current um, activities uh, in this area include uh, works on future internet architecture, uh, where um, uh, Patrick Agupong has looked at the economics of content delivery, and, and uh, Nandi Zhang is currently looking at issues in uh, multi-homing and, and uh, uh, competition among uh, different service providers. Uh, in our field, the Telecommunications Policy Research Conference is the biggest conference uh, at which papers on telecom and information policy are presented. And it is not atypical to have a dozen EPP students, uh, faculty, and alumni uh, presenting papers at that conference. Indeed, uh, over the 43 years that the conference has been going on, uh, there have been 101 papers presented by CMU affiliates at that conference. Uh, and this is a, a picture uh, uh, we took at the uh, 2011 conference. Of course, the important work gets done afterwards in the bar. Uh, and uh, uh, I think with that, I will uh, conclude. Thank you. everybody, I'm Lori Craner, and I'm going to talk about the security and privacy research that has been done in EPP over the years. Um, so I have not actually been in the department for, um, uh, for 40 years or even 25 years. <laughs> I, I've been in the department for about 13 years, uh, but I did my best to go, to go back there and um, and, and, and try to find some of the, the, the work that came uh, before I was in the department. Uh, but forgive me if I've missed somebody. Um, I, I have identified that there are at least 13 um, completed theses in EPP related to security or privacy or both. Sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, 
So the first one uh, that I was able to find uh, comes from Jean Camp, um, who uh, graduated in 1996. Um, that's actually the same time that I graduated in EPP at a different university. Um, so I, I actually knew Jean uh, as, as a grad student. Um, and she was looking at anonymity in e-commerce um, at the time, uh, one of the uh, first um, uh, people to really look uh, at that sort of thing. Um, the next EPP uh, security and privacy thesis actually was quite some time later, as best I can tell, and that was uh, Cynthia Kuo, who was working with Adrian Perig. And she was looking at um, the security of communication protocols and how to make sure that the human factors did not interfere with their security. Uh, basically, if you have a secure protocol and the humans don't actually do the protocol properly, you may think you're secure, but you're not. And so she did a number of studies uh, looking at what kinds of errors humans were making and how to redesign some protocols to avoid those errors. The next thesis I found was uh, from Elaine Newton, who did her thesis on biometrics and surveillance uh, with Granger Morgan. And uh, she w did uh, some studies looking at the state of biometric systems um, and especially focusing on some of the privacy issues associated uh, with biometric systems. And she did some work on um, facial recognition facial recognition, and in particular, how you could thwart facial recognition systems in order to protect privacy. The next one is one of my own students, Steve Chang, who's here. There he is in the back. Um, here's Steve uh, many years ago. <laughs> um, <laughs> Steve did work on uh, anti-phishing user education. Um, and uh, Steve's thesis uh, focused on looking at what uh, were some of the um, problems associated with phishing, who were the stakeholders who could potentially um, uh, do something to intervene to address the phishing issue, who were the stakeholders who were suffering because of phishing, and he came up with this really cool intervention, which was this video game called Anti-Phishing Phil. And uh, when you play the game, you're Phil the fish, and you swim around, and you try not to get hooked by these, um, uh, <laughs> these worms that turn out to be evil websites. Um, it, was, uh, it was actually, it's a very simple idea, but it was a really cool game, and we put it up on our website, and we started getting calls from companies wanting to license it in order to train their employees. Um, and that actually ended up resulting in spinning off a company called Wombat Security Technologies, um, which uh, there are three faculty uh, co-founded, and um, it's now more than eight years, and the company uh, has over 100 employees uh, in the Strip District and is doing very well. Right, the next uh, privacy thesis comes from Janice Sai, who is also here in the room. And, um, Janice was also one of my students. She was looking at the impact of salient information to uh, help influence privacy decision making. And she did a study which was one of the first studies, perhaps the first study, that demonstrated that people uh, will pay for privacy uh, in the right conditions. Um, and this, the, the, the paper um, that was the heart of this thesis um, won the Information Systems Research 2012 Best Published Paper Award. Now, the other thing that was particularly interesting about uh, this thesis is that in order to measure whether people would pay for privacy, we needed to have them make purchases um, and give them some choices of where to make their purchases. And we needed to have them purchase some privacy-sensitive items. So this one's for, for Granger. <laughs> um, <laughs> So uh, we, we, we settled on sex toys, um, and um, uh, we, we needed to uh, have them actually purchase these items with their own credit cards, but we decided they didn't actually need to receive them at their homes, so they were actually shipped to my office. <laughs> They make great graduation gifts. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
Uh, so the next, uh, the next thesis came from Alicia McDonald, one of my students, and she looked at, um, among other things, the cost of reading privacy policies. Um, and this is probably my most heavily cited paper, both uh, cited in, um, in, in other uh, scientific publications, but also in the press and in uh, policy briefings and things like that. Uh, basically, Alicia did um, a fairly sophisticated back of the envelope calculation of what would happen if people read all the privacy policies for all the websites they visit, which of course would never happen. But what, what, if, it, what if they did? And basically she found that people would spend 244 hours per year reading privacy policies, which basically tells you that that approach to policy making is pretty much ridiculous. Um, so this has, um, I said this has been heavily cited and, and uh, quoted even today. And uh, Alicia actually just emailed me the other day and said, you know, it's been 10 years. Maybe we should do a 10-year update on this. OK, uh, next one uh, is Adam Taggart, who is here. Um, and uh, uh, I was not Adam's advisor, but he took my class, I think, his first year here. And there's a picture at the uh, class project poster session. Um, so Adam looked at uh, cybersecurity challenges in developing nations and focused on Rwanda and Tunisia for his thesis. And his advisor uh, was Benoit Morel. All right, the next thesis uh, was another one of my students, uh, Pedro Leon, who looked at privacy, notice, and choice in practice. Um, I think this is the largest of the theses from my students. And uh, Pedro looked at... Um, notice and choice in many different areas, uh, one of which was in um, banking. And uh, he did a study that examined the privacy policies in over 6,000 US banks. And we ended up developing a search engine with all of the data. And you can go to our lab's website and search for banks in your zip code and see um, a comparison of their privacy policies. Um, he also did some work looking at um, the online behavioral advertising industry and their use of notice and choice and found that um, uh, it's not nearly as good as what they claim. Um, that's been uh, some heavily cited work. Um, and two of his papers were recognized by the Future of Privacy Forum. Um, they have an annual award for privacy papers for policymakers. Okay, uh, the next thesis is from Rebecca Balibaco on smartphone data sharing. And Rebecca's in the back of the room, hiding. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, Rebecca did, did uh, a number of studies related to the security and privacy risks associated with uh, smartphones. Um, and uh, she did an interesting uh, study where she looked at um, some guidance on privacy policies for smartphone apps that was coming out of the Department of Commerce's multi-stakeholder process. Um, and Rebecca had been participating in that process and was frustrated because they were trying to come up with guidelines for notifying consumers about privacy, but it was a room full of lawyers and policy wonks and nobody who uh, knew anything about usability and user testing or anything like that, except for Rebecca, um, were in the room. Um, so uh, they kept saying they were going to do user studies. They didn't. And at the last minute, Rebecca came to me and said, please, can we do a user study? So I said, well, you have a budget of $1,000. See what you can do. Um, and she did come in under budget with a great study, um, which found that basically the proposed uh, guidelines were um, fairly useless. Um, it's been a couple of years, and uh, they pushed out the guidelines anyway, and nobody uses them. So uh, we feel somewhat vindicated, although it, it's a little sad. Um, all right, the next one is Christian Bravo Lillo, um, who did his thesis uh, examining security warnings and how to overcome the problem that we all become habituated and just swat them away and don't actually pay any attention to the warnings. Uh, so uh, Christian developed a number of different types of warnings. And then his problem was, how can he test all of these warnings on large groups of people um, in a way that was feasible and in a way that these people didn't know that what he was after was testing warnings. Um, and so he developed an online framework where people would come to the website in order to play video games and review them. Um, but as they were playing these games, 
every now and then a warning would pop up. And what he was actually after is what did they do when they saw the warnings? Uh, so it was a clever approach and it allowed us to gather a lot of interesting data about different types of warnings and what was most effective. And he had a paper that won um, a distinguished paper award at the Symposium on Usable Privacy and Security in 2013. Okay, the um, next one is, uh, is not my student, it's Nicholas Kristen's student, uh, Nectarios, Le I don't know how to say his last name, Leo, Leo T Leontiadis, or something close to that, hopefully. Um, but anyway, uh, Nectarios uh, did some work on cybercrime supply chains. Uh, he, in particular, was looking at uh, pharmaceuticals, such as Viagra, that are being sold online. Um, and uh, was able to collect a lot of uh, really uh, interesting data that allowed them to create economic models of the uh, various actors in the supply chains and identify uh, places in the, in the supply chain where there was a choke point where we might be able to uh, do something to actually uh, stop uh, part of this problem. Uh, it was a really uh, great thesis and it was um, uh, nominated by CMU for the ACM doctoral dissertation competition. Next, we have Dave Gordon's thesis in 2014, uh, working with Travis Bro, And uh, Dave was looking at privacy requirements across jurisdictions. He looked at a number of privacy and security uh, related laws in different states and tried to come up with a framework that allowed you to compare these laws. This is really useful for companies who have to comply with laws across 50 states and need to find a, um, a sensible way that they can understand what are all the laws they need to comply with and, and what do they need to do so that their practices are going to be compliant with, with all of the laws. And finally, we have Casey Canfield, who you all heard from earlier uh, today, um, who, uh, who, who did not start off in uh, the security area, but ended up doing a cybersecurity uh, thesis where she um, used uh, signal detection theory to analyze phishing risk um, and actually picked up on some of the work that Steve Sheng had done a number of years earlier. Um, and so she uh, did um, uh, so, so some work on um, evaluating people's susceptibility to phishing risk and then modeling that. Uh, to try to understand uh, uh, the uh, impact of different types of interventions. So finally, I want to mention some work that, uh, that I've done along with Nicholas Christian and some of our uh, students who are not in EPP uh, yet, but we hope to bring some EPP students into this as well. Uh, we've been looking at password security and usability um, for the past uh, seven years or so. Um, and we've been looking at at how do you have a password policy that will um, be usable by people, but also secure. Um, we have collected um, many, many passwords from volunteers and people we've paid to create passwords over the years. We've analyzed all of the passwords for CMU students, faculty, and staff, um, and found some interesting results there. Um, and we've developed a scientific approach to actually putting a number on password security. Uh, we've been using uh, the, this data to develop a password meter, which is actually informed by data. A lot of the password meters you see on websites on the internet are actually pretty bogus. Um, when they tell you your password is good and bad, uh, they're actually, for the most part, not really giving you very good advice. Uh, so we have a data-driven password meter that um, is not only more accurate, but actually has some specific suggestions for how do you make your password better rather than uh, your password is weak, do better. Um, we're in the process of releasing that um, as an open source project. Um, and the work in this area uh, won um, the best paper award at Usenix 2016. And um, we've uh, been alerted, we'll be getting uh, the best paper award at CHI 2017 next month. So and with that, I will hand it over. So, uh, hi, my name is Martin Weiss. I go back a little bit. I, uh, Keith was reflecting on um, the size of his incoming class, and I will tell you that we had just enough students to fill out an intramural basketball team. <laughs> 
that started my class. So, um, and I, I, I'm going to follow Vint Cerf's admonition that power corrupts and PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. So I'm just speaking from notes here, you know. So, um, you know, first I, I, I have to, it's impossible to talk about ICT research at EPP without acknowledging Granger's vision to persuade Marvin to come here. Um, to me, Marvin, um, and again, this is personal, Marvin was my advisor, as many of you know. Um, it really put EPP on the map. Um, Marvin was an influential player in ICT research when he was up at MIT before he came here. Um, he was well known in the field and, and very impactful. And so I personally was delighted when he came. Um, it changed the course of my own research direction. Um, I mean, Marvin really underplayed the range of things that he's been involved with over the course of his career. I mean, you didn't talk anything about the deregulation work that, the, the, that happened prior to coming, the AT&T work, the, the uh, I mean, the open network architecture, all of that stuff. I mean, there was a whole pile of things that, that went on before this that, um, I, I, I mean, to, to my, when I look, at, look across the span of this, it, um, it kind of laid a foundation for how to think about a lot of these problems. I mean, Marvin mentioned some of the cost analysis work. I mean, that's something that I learned. I've used it a couple of times in my own career, um, talking about voice over IP, for example, and, and, and other kinds of projects. Um, so I, I guess the other thing I wanted to mention, and again, I can, I, I don't want to go on for, for too terribly long, but the other thing that's been really Im impactful for me personally has been the, just the surprising endurance of the research methods course that, that Granger established. I, um, <clears throat> I keep going back to that course. I mean, the stuff that we learned in that course, it was such a, a wide range of things. And, and ICT, as, as you saw from these topics, in ICT, you touch everything. You touch technology, you touch policy, you touch economics, you touch statistics, you touch a whole range of topics. And, and um, the research methods class was really remarkable in that we gained, gained access to a lot of different ways of thinking about things. Uh, and this, I, I think it really came home to me just a few years ago when I was thinking of the, of the problem of spectrum sharing where I'm working in right now with John and, um, and others. And you know, there was a topic at one point, it was I think more or less a footnote when we talked about the, the, the problem of shared resources. People think about the tragedy of the commons, but I, I remember a short discussion. It wasn't terribly long about that. It doesn't have to be that way, that there are these approaches to resource governance that people like Eleanor Ostrom and others have, have studied. And it kind of, I, I can't say that I went back to my notes, but I did go back into the literature and, and it's kind of set me on a whole different path at this point in my career. Um, the other thing that working in ICTs, especially from an EPP perspective, has taught me is interdisciplinarity is really, really hard. Um, and yet this is not a surprise to anybody here in this room. I and mean, we all struggle with, you know, how do you, how do you take, um, how do you get engineers to talk to economists, for example, or how do you, I mean, Keith was talking about that in, in, his, uh, in, in his area. Um, in my own per job across the street right now, we're kind of charged with forming a school that explicitly does interdisciplinary work. And, and you, know, you know, so people will say, oh yes, we'll, we'll just go and do this. It's like, no, 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 not so fast. You really have to understand language, you have to understand culture, you have to understand background. This is the kind of foundation that EPP has, has given me and has provided me, a, I guess, a really durable foundation to build a career on. Um, and, and so I have to commend Granger for that. I have to com commend the rest of the faculty. I have to thank Marvin for his patience with me as I was kind of struggling through my own dissertation process. But it's been, um, it's been a remarkably um, resilient and, and, I don't know, useful foundation. It's really all I wanted to say. And I, I thank you for the opportunity to speak with you.